um, a great friend of mine and, uh, and also to the Chief Minister, a Professor Dr. No Azlan is actually the Vice Chancellor of University Kebangsaan Malaysia since 1st January of 2014. He began his career at the university over 25 years ago as a lecturer in the Faculty of Business. Professor Noor Azlan is also the Commonwealth Fellow of Financial Economics and Banking at the Association of Commonwealth Universities, ACU, as well as the Mason Fellow at the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University in USA. He currently heads the Economic and Finance Cluster at the National Council of Professors in Malaysia. From April 2006 till September 2009, Professor Noor Azlan was, pr prior to his uh, appointment as uh, Vice Chancellor of UKM, he was seconded to the Prime Minister's Department. And during his tenure at the PM's Department, he has served as the head of the Special Consultancy Team on Globalization, National Economic Action Council, NEAC, the Director of Microeconomics and Investments, National Implementation Directorate, NID, as well as the Director of the Malaysian Development Institute in the Economic Planning Unit. Prior to this segment, Professor Noor Azlan was the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and International Affairs, Dean at UKM Graduate School of Business, Dean at the Faculty of Economics and Business, and the Chair at the Graduate School of Business, University of Kwasa, Malaysia. Throughout his career, Professor Noor Azlan has been actively participating in national level strategic initiatives and has assumed leadership roles in several of them. These include, among others, the Blue Ocean Strategy Study on Macro Strategic Directions, the New Sources of Growth Initiative of the Economic Council, the formulation of strategic directions as well as the development of an, an outcome-based framework for the 10 Malaysia Plan. <clears throat> I'm proud to also mention that Professor Noor Azlan was also one of the inspirational architects of the state's long-term master plan called Para Amanjaya, which has given birth to not just the think tank which is organizing this whole event called uh, Institute Dari Rizwan, but also some of the great ideas that come along it, in, including the organizing of the Panko Dialogue from its early days. And um, Professor Noor Azlan recently obtained a Master's in Public Administration from Harvard University. He has earlier earned his MBA in Finance and PhD in Economics from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, USA. And it is with in great honor that I would like to welcome Professor Dato, Dr. Noor Azran Ghazali to be on stage with us today. Please welcome. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, very good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Dato Amin, uh, Saudara Mazlan, Dr. Mazlan. Uh, and also ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a very, I, I'm feeling so happy because of the organizations of this uh, PIDD are coming to a stage that we see a lot of things are happening from uh, such a very small ideas of uh, gathering people to talk about development, but now it uh, expanded into many other things and uh, attracting a lot of uh, uh, audiences uh, from different uh, sectors, from the industries, from the government, and also from the universities. I was tasked to talk about growth and inclusivity. I shape it a little bit from the perspective that probably will be a meaningful uh, sharing this, uh, this afternoon. Is it coming up? No. Okay. Uh, the reason that I put these two together because of every time when people talk about growth, uh, claiming some success about growth, then immediately you hear on the other side, people say, what growth? I don't feel it. 
some group will say that uh, the economy is growing very fast. The economy is growing, you know, at a 6.3% rate for the last 50 years. But still, we are hearing people saying that there are certain group of communities are still being left behind. And it seems like uh, growth and inclusivity is not something compatible. For Malaysia, when we talk about growth, we always talk about how to get the economy moving a lot faster. For example, if you look at the economic transformation plan, which is lauded by the government today, on average, they are talking about 6% growth. The economy has to keep on going at an average speed of 6% growth, and that will take you uh, to the state of a high-income economy, advanced economy. But growth by itself has to be planned. Without a proper plan, we will not be able to see growth. So the first part of my sharing is that I'm going to talk a little bit about growth process because I think this is prime. In many cases, sometimes in Malaysia, sometimes you heard of this mantra of growth and distribution. So they talk about both. They talk about growth and distribution. But in most cases, what get most attended is the distribution rather than the growth. Sometimes without growth, so people are busy when they talk about distribution. Their concern is about how to slice the cake. But very few people are talking about how to make the cake bigger. So everybody is busy about how to slice the cake. What is my part of the cake, but no one is talking about how to bake the cake and make the cake look bigger. So let's talk a little bit about growth. Engine of growth, I always use this locomotive. This is a huge uh, train locomotive. The idea is that this locomotive is right in the front of pulling all the coaches ahead together and moving fast towards certain directions. So when we talk about engine of growth, how do we mobilize the resources to create growth? Now, normally in many cases, people will tend to look into what are the natural endowment that they have. And in the early days of growth, natural endowment normally become the first thing that the citizens or the country will explore into. Look at the case of Perak, for example. Everyone who learn about Perak will definitely see two things, tin and rubber, right? Because these are natural endowments. You are endowed with all the climates, you are endowed with the minerals, you are endowed with the environment that would allow you to grow rubber and also to mine tins. In many cases, countries tend to pay a lot of attention in extracting this so-called gift of God, basically, you know, the endowments that you have down there. But over the years, endowments are limited. These are rule of economics that endowments, the more you take it out, the left, the less that remains. Uh, all forms of natural endowments are subject to this so-called declining kind of uh, returns. The more you dig it out, the less remain and to get more out of it, the more costly it becomes. Not only in terms of the technology, but also in terms of the externalities, the cost that it might create toward the environment, toward the other parts of the economy. Endowments can be a good guide, but having endowments alone is not yet sufficient. Sometimes in Malaysia, let's relate to the case of Malaysia, someone saw that there is a waterfall and immediately they say, they, okay, let's do tourism. Why? Because we have the waterfalls. You know? But waterfall alone by itself is not yet a sufficient condition to make sure that your tourism business will flourish. Because there's a lot more that has to come along, around that waterfall to make sure that that waterfall becomes attractive. For a nation, <laughs> then the next stage normally we'll talk about this so-called the more macro environment. A lot of attention is being given to this so-called macro stabilities and so on. If you look at <coughs> many indicators, 
that are being used by the international agencies, be it, for example, World Bank, IMD, and many other agencies, when they look at the nation, the stability of the economy, they start to put in the macro numbers, inflation rates, employment rates, and then they talk about uh, the education, they talk about some other aspect of uh, uh, utilities and so on, electricity and so on. And many are focusing at the macro numbers as an indication that this is a potential place. But achieving macro numbers alone is still yet to be the right or the sufficient uh, things that would allow the economy to grow. Many countries, they have a very stable economy. But stability of economy is the requirements for you to have uh, economic growth. What do you want actually from this uh, in, in terms of managing the economy right? Take for example, these days, when I am standing up uh, on the stage, normally people will start to talk about exchange rate stability. You know, people talk about, you know, when, when we want to, when we see these patterns of exchange rate, when we see patterns of even before the GST was introduced and so on, everybody was crying as though as everything will collapse. In 2008 and 2009, when the price of oil reached the peak, I think it's about 139 per barrel dollars. The only cry that Malaysia has is that if the price of petroleum goes down, economy will be booming. But these days, the price of petroleum is almost at the bottom. And yet, the economy is not booming as well. Meaning that, you know, I mean, it seems like either going up or going down is not yet a criteria that would determine whether the economy is growing or not. Now, there is one more dimension that need us uh, need our attention, which is the microeconomic of how the economy is working. <coughs> we have the foundations, we have the endowments, you have the macro stability, but now the micro side of things. I think with the advancement of knowledge, with the advancement of technology, the micro attention toward growth are very important. It takes us to pay a very detailed attention. This is a level that normally being left out. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, this is the dimensions of looking at the quality of business. This is the dimension and looking at how industries operate and how they strategize themselves and what are the level of competition that is actually going on within a particular sector. This is the so-called micro dimensions of growth or competitiveness that need us to pay more attention to. Let me give you one example. If we want to create a growth in certain sectors, let's speak, for example, my favorite example is the solar industry. In Malaysia, actually, we have solar operations in Kulim. We have solar, I think, a little bit in Perak, maybe. Maybe there are solar in in Malacca, there is a global solar valley. And uh, having the investment in Malaysia by itself is not yet sufficient to allow us to see the solar industry to flourish in Malaysia. Because the solar industry would require many other things surrounding it. I remember that at one time, we are you know, talking to a group of investors who would like to explore into something to do with uh, nanotechnology. Among the first thing when they landed, myself and Jared were there, we were working together. What they want to know first is that they ask us, does Malaysia has the technology capability to, pro to, to go forward in solar? How many solar professors that you have in the country? How many centers that are working on solar technology? How many PhDs and scientists that we produce in solar industries? The first visit is to visit all the centers of solar technology in the country. They yet to talk about where to go, where to invest and so on. After they are convinced with these so-called capabilities, 
solid the nanotechnologies then they talk about location they are counting from hours of time their engineers from japan to reach to the workplace all the way from narita coming to malaysia going to the next location and then how much time does it take for them to enter their their factories and that pass out and then we go to the next stage and it, they are asking us about the financing of this so-called nano industries whether can we have access to finance and so on and even after you pass through the first question is very technology and then it's logistic technology logistic finance and the last question they ask us whether do you have intellectual property capabilities to basically go to the court in case if there is some so called intellectual property cases brought to the court because they are bringing in the new technology and again i have to go around and see whether does malaysian have that capabilities of ip capabilities to deal in the court see nano technology logistic finance and finally legal in order for one industry to be growing in certain place it requires a lot of things happening around it and this aspect of micro competitiveness this aspect the micro elements of growth is what is probably missing in my perspective of looking into malaysia come back to the case of solar if we are able to put all the solar industries together in one location then you will be able to see that the industry will be growing a lot faster proximity are very important let me try with you if i say that i want to go to sorry i have to mention this place if i want to go to lawyat what do you think am i going to buy am i going to buy a car no am i going to buy kain batik songket no well without telling 99% you say that you must be looking for something ICT hey i'm going to jalan tengku abdul rahman what do you think i'm looking for well most likely maybe you know i mean clothing linen something like that so see you see locations they are being the the the, the agglomerations or the dense of activities are very important so in order for us to create growth we have to take into account all these so called dense of activities and the nearness the idea of putting investment one in the north one in the south one in the east one in the west for the sake of distribution and inclusivity is wrong though it seems like you are distributing things around now we have this so called growth now the next issue is that will the growth that we are creating gives enough room for everyone this is just for the sake of illustration you see that this train is fill up with people imagine that this is a growth process that we are creating the train is moving to one place one destination but how many people can be on the train in short inclusivity how many people will benefit from this growth process i don't know i mean i think this slide is clear enough can you count how many women there is there any women here i don't know i yet to find one is there any women huh? they are either in the front or maybe they are not able to stand up that long to jump on the train like this this growth process actually are not able to accommodate everybody now there come a cry of where is inclusivity in growth why do you create growth if i couldn't benefit from the growth what kind of growth are you creating because it let me behind some people are going a lot faster but i am behind in terms of growth process now you start to see people resist from the growth process growth the you create resistance in growth some probably will come with a smarter idea saying that how do you get inclusivity any idea and people are crying for reducing the cost of living and some probably will go to the extreme saying that 
slow down the growth process. Maybe we have this. <laughs> this is for the sake of inclusivity. Everybody is on board. But the problem is that when everybody try to be on board, the train might not be able to move. I don't even know who actually uh, steering this train. Or maybe this guy up here. Look at this guy. This is you create the dependency. The first person is holding the train. The second person is holding the person who hold to the train. And the third person is holding to the person to the person that is holding the train. Now, economists talk about dependency ratio. That in one family, only one person is working. The rest, 12 of them, is actually depending on one person. And if this person, he miss out, and all of them will collapse. Look at this guy. He barely holding to other persons to make sure that he is on board. But even with this situation, you see there's a lot more people down there are not able to join in in the growth process. So now, we want growth. We want also inclusivity. We want to get the economy to move, but at the same time, we want to make sure that Inclusivity in the sense from the perspective of people, the household, as well as from the perspective of the region. If you look at growth process, normally growth process will not be automatically dispersed. If you want to open up a clinic, for example, if any one of you are a medical doctor, you want to open up a GP, where would you go? Busy place or quiet place? You will go to the place where there are a lot of people. Where, is a lot, where, where in Malaysia, where are the places there are a lot of people? It is in the urban area. So naturally, everybody who are thinking from their own perspective of growth, they will like to be places where there is already growth. So now it gets things worse because it makes certain areas of the economy to be far behind and less and less resources will be going there. Now, this is... The truth about growth process. Growth process are good at discriminating. Growth resources, normally they go to places where they can get the most of it. But the problem is that if this is allowed just to be like that, it means that growth will not be balanced. It means that there will be part of the economy where people are not benefiting from growth. This is the case of the economic dualism. You know, you are in KL, that's fine. You travel for about one hour, you go to somewhere in Kuala Pila, you go further down to Batu KK, you go further down to Padang Leba, and you go further down to the Jambatan Bossi, then you will see that there's no development there. Development is concentrated in certain areas, and certain areas are being left behind. But we cannot afford to allow that to happen. So we have to plan. Growth has to be planned, Growth has to be planned such that it is compatible with so-called inclusivity. If you think that the growth process will filter down, trust me, it will never filter down. Because there is a lot of layers up there that will make sure that the growth process basically just remain at certain place. Sometimes we heard of the idea of filtering down in the sense that when you create growth up there, as though as you pour water uh, dalam pasu bunga, for example, then you hope the water will flow down, but actually it is not. Because there is a lot of so-called inefficiencies, there's a lot of imperfection along the way that will not assure that that water will flow all the way down. That is the reason. This is what we call market imperfection or market failures. You know, this can be very troublesome. In banking, those who study banking, well, one of the goals in terms of you in evaluating loan performance, loan, uh, uh, loan application, is to see which one is the most potential. If there are two persons come to you, one is a very established business guy, one is a startup, one has a lot of collateral, the other one has nothing, I mean, nothing with them, only ideas, Tell me which one will you choose. 
he will choose the more established, the more promising, the person that has collateral, the person that has track records and so on. So what happened to the new startup? Then you see that these market failures will always discriminate away this kind of uh, you know, new startup and so on. So therefore, knowing that that's how the market works, I strongly believe that growth has to be planned and, well, let's not use the word intervention, but has to be planned strategically such that it will disperse and it will assure inclusivity. Let's look at some of the model. This is a model that looks into how growth can lead toward inclusivity. This is a 3D model, the work that is uh, basically extracted from the work of uh, Paul Krugman. The idea is that Krugman looking at the growth process and start to see there is a geography in growth. Why is that growth is happening here, but it's not happening here? What is so special at this place? Why is that certain locations are known for certain products? If I say watch, what would you say? New York watch? You will say Swiss watch, even though you, I might get this in Padang Besar. When I go to Disney World, if I go to Orlando, what kind of tourism that you have in mind? Maybe I can test you. Let me mention three places and see whether can you catch this up. I will mention Bali, Phuket, and Orlando. In three seconds, you can imagine it, right? Where do I enjoy the best roller coaster? Orlando. You will not say that, hey, I went to Bali, I enjoy a roller coaster. People look at you, what's wrong with you? You go to Bali, you shouldn't enjoy a roller coaster. You want to enjoy a roller coaster, you go to Orlando. See, these three are offering the same kind of macro goods. They are all offering leisures. But again, you go micro, they are offering different kind of leisure. Bali will offer more traditional. Orlando will be offering more futuristic. And I don't know, Phuket, what do they offer? But see, you see that if we want to create growth, remember that growth, growth are associated with location. This is as an example. Imagine that the state of Perak. Maybe, you know, just a quick illustration of it. There are, of course, there are so many districts, so many areas, and there are so-called things that are preventing them from connecting to each other. Right? Imagine that each locality, either they are being... Uh, separated by some natural kind of uh, forces or they don't have any connectivity. If you want to create growth, the first rule of thumb is to create density. It has to be dense. Growth must come first before we talk about di distributing the benefit of growth. So first is to create the density. And we have to be able to mobilize resources so that it tends to cluster in certain areas. This is sometimes can be very difficult because people will say, I want to do tourism. The other side say, I want to do tourism. The other side say, hey, I have, a, I have a waterfall. I want to do tourism. Everybody do tourism a little bit and none of them successful. You have to make some strategic decision which part of the economy will get something. But it does not mean that it throw away all other industries. What it means is that you bring density, strategically attract investment to come to one location and put up all the facilities around it. The next thing what you need to do is to remove the so-called division. <coughs> you know, division can, sometimes can be very strange in terms of the effect. In some, the logic of economy says that if you have uh, two buckets, you fill up with water, the water will spill over to the other bucket and the other bucket will benefit. But if there is a thick division behind it, that benefit will not spill over to the other side. That allows inclusivity and distribution to take place. Sometimes, you know, you see that, if I may give an example, if you look at Singapore, if you are down Singapore, you see Singapore just over there. But actually, the true economic distance might be very far somewhere in Australia. I don't know. 
you know, economic distance is not the same as geographical distance. So we have to plan uh, in terms of to make sure that there is no division uh, that are dividing this, uh, dividing this region. And then connect them. You have to make sure that they are connected in order for this movement has to, can take place. That's why coming from uh, KL to Ipoh, for example, now with all the double tracking and hopefully, I don't know, I mean, recently I was in, uh, was in Taipei going to a distance of KL and Ipoh, which takes only about 40 minutes on a high-speed train. And that makes probably people living in Ipoh and working in KL. Even now, I think with all the train facilities, people start doing that. Most important is not where people work, but they spend the money where they stay. You can remain like this, but as long as you have a good connectivity, then you can create all this kind of growth. And then, creating something that comes along that. This is what we call the related and supporting industries, institution for collaboration, training institutions, R&D. If you want to bring solar, within that, there must be solar scientists, solar engineers, and so on. There must be SMEs surrounding that are focusing and supporting the industry of solar. That's how we have to do it. And uh, by doing this, the 3D, creating density, removing the division, and uh, re shorten the distance, then hopefully we will be able to create growth, but at the same time to be able to distribute and to assure that inclusivity. What we want is something you know, to create this kind of growth. You know, look at this photo. Even you feel so relaxed looking at it, right? I mean, it takes you so fast. But you want to make sure that while it's moving fast, everyone is well served and enjoying the rides. So this is the kind of economic growth that we want. We want Malaysian economy, hopefully para economy will move that fast, but at the same time, everybody is there to enjoy this growth process. The, if we don't plan this together, trust me, the train will finally stop because people are not benefiting from growth. So that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope the sharing will be useful for us to think about a growth process uh, and how to assure inclusivity. Thank you very much. So what do we have now? Okay. Thank you, Professor. Now, ladies and gentlemen, do you have any questions for Prof? We do have time to take a few. I think it's been about four years I haven't asked you a question, so it's high time <laughs> I do that. Well, it's a great presentation. You, you are, as much as we are in developing Perak Manjaya from the start, way back in 2009, I remember those days, we sit down together, you were talking about 3D and everything. And I think we have put it in into the overall plan for the state, we actually look at 3D as a model. Mm. And very much we try to do so. Well, that was when I was running the tin tank and given the brain. But now that I was given the hands and legs to do it, I find it more difficult to do it than thinking about it. So what are the examples that you think we can learn from on how do we accelerate <laughs> growth with inclusivity. I mean, uh, in, 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 ma in making sure that connecting the dots that you showed earlier can really be done. Okay, thank you. We are looking at this area. There's nothing here still, right? What you have a little bit here is already a, a good starting point of the 3D. You are creating density. You are pushing development in one location. Let me give you another example, which is so close to me. If you went to Bandar Baru Bangi or Bangi and Serdang, actually, if you flip all the trees around, you will see there are at least 30 to 40 research institutes surrounding that area. Just name it. Before you enter UKM, you will see 
National Institute for Occupational and Safety, NIOSH. You will see the legal, you will see genome, you will see uh, nuclear, you will see uh, Petronas, you will see all the banks are lining up on the other side. You see the so-called Rural Development Research Center. You see all sorts of research centers there. Not far away, there is Mardi, and just name it. MPOB, everything is there. They have the first D. The density is there. But trust me, while they are near, actually they are very far. The distance is actually, the true distance is very far. Many of us actually have never knocked each other's door. We never talk to each other. We don't really know who they are. And, and what are they doing? And what are we doing? We never share. There is no platform. What we need to do, and then recently we call up. You know, I call up about, uh, yeah, you need a champion. You need someone who basically to take lead in terms of mobilizing this. It will not happen naturally. See, this is about 40 research institute. Bandar Baru Bangi, actually, if you can assure the other 2D can happen, which means you remove the division, allow them to talk, allow them to share facilities. You don't need, I mean, kind of MOUs, things like that. Just go in and do it. And uh, connectivity, you should be able, Malaysia should declare that we have a knowledge valley of Southeast Asia. No one ever recognized Bangi and Serdang as the knowledge valley of Southeast Asia. Because there is one D, but there are, there's no other two Ds. No one is working on it. Everybody is working in their own buildings and they don't talk to each other. We have to really, you know, someone has to create that networking. They must be, I heard of in Silicon Valley, for example, there are organizations organizing luncheon. Lunch. So that engineers talk to each other. That's how you benefit from density. So this has to be planned. There must be a group of people, their job is only about getting people to interact to each other, see more of each other, I and mean, then share all the information and so on. Um, I don't know, the experience of being in Boston, there are five, six universities surrounding there. There's a, I think Boston is just like Bangi. Uh, it's the highest uh, PhD per capita in Malaysia, I think it's Bandar Baru Bangi. Every alternate house, there's someone PhD holders there. True. I mean, if you go to Bangi, you check around, you see that guy has a PhD, he worked in Mardi, that guy has a PhD, he worked in this Genome Institute, that guy is UKM, this guy, and so on. You go to even to the night market, Pasar Malam also, there's a very educated uh, Pasar Malam market, you know, people who are doing the shoppings. But we are not able to create that growth. To cross the highway, I mean, it's not easy. Um, in, in Boston, for example, those in MIT can take courses in BU, can take courses in Harvard, can take courses at Tufts, and just do it. I mean, there is not much division. Here, you got to bring tons of letters. First, show your pass. Who's, who are you meeting? And before you exit, you again have to show their pass. I think the point is that the 3D, yes. I mean, conceptually, it is the, the logic of economic is there, but it still it will not happen by itself. It needs someone to mastermind that, someone to allow that to happen, and to really understand the concept of uh, promoting the 3D for the sake of growth and also inclusivity. We have to, you know, basically find uh, that that mastermind is very important in terms of uh, move and realizing this 3D. Um, I believe that the idea of concentrating everything in one place was not an original idea, right? I think the idea was, was born when Cyberjaya was created. And then when Cyberjaya became a success, I think the government called a few academicians, of, a lot of academicians, under the Malaysian Institute of Economics, to, to plan, to give some idea of the rolling out plan, rolling out, you know, rolling out plan to roll out Cyberjaya to other regions of Malaysia. But I, I realized that in that discussion, quite a number of lecturers opposed to the idea of rolling out for the same reason that you mentioned just now. There must be concentration, there must be more symbiosis, there must be growth in that region. But somehow we're going to be dispersed. 
Now, but, but now, I think the situation has become different, Prof. In those days, the Taman Toraza, Taman, Tumraman, they built highways, roads, and roads create growth and land prices go up. But nowadays, we got another kind of roads, which is the broadband. Mm. How do you see the broadband can be another way of uh, creating that part of the treaties? I mean, th th there is no doubt that this uh, technological development, communication development, communication technology is creating another virtual highways among us. And values are being created by just uh, whenever people... As long as people are connected, then values are created. The point is not it has to be physical infrastructure, but of course physical infrastructure is still needed, but... Whenever people are connected, you know, you heard about this so-called the network economy. Uh, when one person has a mobile phone, it's useless because there's no other person to talk to. When the second person has a mobile phone, well, the value is created because you can talk to two person. But when the third person, fourth person, one millionth person have the, the mobile phone, then everybody is connected at that point. If you opt not to have a mobile phone, you are handicapped. So meaning that it becomes a must. Connectivity is a must. I mean, saying that, sorry, you cannot reach me, sorry, I cannot, I mean, I can't do it, and so on, is no longer acceptable. But of course, there is an unfortunate part of it. It takes away our weekend, it takes away our holidays, you know. But I, I have uh, not that many, there are a few friends who says that I'm, I still can't allow this thing to come with me at all time. But I still, you know, looking at uh, younger generation students today, uh, you know, sometimes in university, uh, whenever you want to enter the exam hall, you have to leave this outside. I still cannot accept that, though my university still practice that. Because to me, this is more like oxygen now. If you want to try, please. Leave your phone somewhere else. You will be like, you know, ikan, da, 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 I feel like something is not right. You know, and connectivity, that's all. And if you are not connected, then you are far behind. And value is created when people are connected. So that's why the job of connecting people, just like I mentioned earlier, about putting people together in one hall and even this PIDD, is about networking. <coughs> it's not about seeing all the booth. All the booths you can see inside here but knowing and connecting to people and that will normally will create values and you know if you may take away from this session connect if you connect you create values thank you very much thank you how about a big hand ladies and gentlemen for professor dr dr noor aslan for that eye-opening session